Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nirav Shaw, and I'm the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Governor Janet Mills and Maine's Department of Health and Human Services Commissioner, Jean Lambrew. We're here today to provide an update on the COVID-19 situation across the state of Maine for today, Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. I'll provide an update on where things stand from an outbreak and epidemiology perspective, and then turn things over to Governor Mills. Right now, across the state, there are a total of 5,989 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 27 cases since yesterday. Of those, 5,341 are confirmed, 648 are probable cases. In terms of hospitalizations, 469 individuals have been hospitalized cumulatively. In the past 30 days, 23 people have been hospitalized, and right now in Maine, nine people are in the hospital with COVID-19, one of whom is in the ICU, and thankfully none of whom is on a ventilator. Overall, there have been 146 individuals who have passed away with COVID-19, the same number as it was yesterday, and 5,206 have recovered, an increase of 31 recoveries since yesterday. Among our cases are 1,107 healthcare workers. I'd like to turn next to provide some updates on two outbreaks in which Maine CDC has just recently opened. The first is at the Duville Pavilion in Lewiston, where we are aware right now of three cases among employees of that facility. I'd like to note that these three individual employees who have tested positive were identified through the state-sponsored testing protocol for, for residents, sorry, for employees of long-term care facilities. This is a pro protocol that's been in place for a while now in which nursing facilities are required to test their staff in order to find cases of COVID-19 before, ideally, before they spread within the facility itself. The next situation I'd like to discuss is a quickly emerging outbreak in a quickly evolving outbreak in and around the Waldo County area. As we initially reported on Saturday, Maine CDC has opened an outbreak investigation into a series of cases primarily based in Waldo County. As of right now, there are 42 cases at present, and the cases range in age from two years old all the way up to 80 years old. Based on what we know right now, we expect the number of cases associated with this outbreak to increase, perhaps significantly. The outbreak appears to have begun at a fellowship gathering convened by the Brooks Pentecostal Church in Brooks, Maine, from, from roughly October 2nd through October 4th. Approximately 100 to 150 people attended that gathering. We also understand that individuals from other churches also attended this gathering, including the Charleston Church, the Quaker Hill Church, as well as members of the Faith Bible College in Charleston. We understand that masks were available, but not routinely used during this fellowship event. Subsequent to that event, we are aware that the Brooks Church itself held services. A typical, church, a typical service convened by the Brooks Church included anywhere uh, from 70 to 100 individuals indoors. The church indicated to us similarly that masks were available but not routinely used. The Brooks Church has temporarily suspended church services in accordance with Maine CDC recommendations at this time. There is a school that is associated with this church, the Lighthouse Christian Academy, that shares the same property as the Brooks Pentecostal Church. The school has a total of 27 children, ranging from kindergarten to high school. And as of right now, our data indicate that seven of the 42 cases are linked to the Christian Academy. Our main CDC case investigators have also detected cases linked to this outbreak 
in other areas of Waldo County. Number one or first, there is a case in a Waldo County long-term care facility, Bayview Manor in Searsport, of an employee. As a result of Maine CDC's protocols and recommendations, Bayview Manor is undertaking universal testing of all, of all residents as well as all staff across their facility. There are also exposures and cases that have been traced to schools. In addition to Lighthouse Christian Academy, there are four other schools across two RSUs that have cases that appear to be linked to this outbreak. The Ames Elementary School in Searsmont, the Captain Albert Stevens School in Belfast, the Troy Howard Middle School also in Belfast, and Mount View Elementary in Thorndike. I wanna be very clear here. There are not outbreaks at these schools. Rather, there are individual cases that are likely linked to the larger outbreak. At this time, Maine CDC does not believe that there has been transmission of COVID-19 that has occurred in these four public schools. Maine CDC and our partners at the Department of Education are working directly with the schools themselves to determine the number of individuals who may have come into contact with the discrete cases at these schools so that those individuals can be monitored for symptoms and recommended for testing. But I just want to be clear at this time, we do not have evidence to suggest that there are outbreaks associated either with these four schools or with the long-term care facility that I mentioned, although our investigation remains underway. Those are the facts as we know them right now. And given the nature of outbreaks of this sort, we will certainly learn more in the coming days and weeks. As with all outbreaks, this is a rapidly evolving situation. Here's what we are doing right now to help everyone who has been potentially affected by this outbreak. The first and among the most important in these times is to equip you with the facts. We are also working with healthcare providers and hospitals in the area to make testing even more readily available to those who need it. Given the involvement of the schools that I mentioned, as I, as I noted, we are identifying close contacts in partnership with the schools directly to make sure those individuals have information on how, whether, and where to get tested. Similarly, given the involvement of the long-term care set facility that I mentioned, working directly with that facility to test their staff as well as residents. What can you do right now? Well, some of the things that you can do starting today, especially if you live in the Waldo County area, are to do some of the things we've talked about. That is to say, wearing face coverings, avoiding large gatherings, and staying home if you're sick. If you are experiencing symptoms, or if you believe that you have come into close contact with someone who may have attended one of these churches or their services, or you yourself may have attended one of those churches or services, please make sure you are taking those symptoms seriously. Testing is already available in this area. Indeed, there are two state-sponsored swab and send sites, Penn Bay, the Penn Bay Hospital, as well as Seaport Community Health Center in Belfast already have swab and send sites that are open and available. We are simultaneously working with healthcare facilities, outpatient clinics, and other providers to make testing even more available, and we will have more updates on that over the next, uh, over the next day or so. Before I, before I turn to some other matters, I just wanna note that although we are talking about Waldo County today, it's likely that we will see other cases, not just in Waldo County, but potentially across other counties in the coming days and weeks. As we've seen with other similar outbreaks, the COVID-19 virus does not honor borders. But again, there are things that you can do today to protect yourself and your family, namely wearing masks and avoiding large gatherings where possible. I'd like to turn now to a couple of updates around testing. Let's first start with our positivity rate. 
based on approximately 4,600 tests reported to Maine CDC yesterday, the one-day positivity rate in Maine was 0.67%. On a seven-day basis, the positivity rate across the state of Maine right now is 0.48%. To put that number in a bit of national context, according to the US CDC, the national positivity rate now stands at 5.4% nationwide, and the rate in Maine is 0.48%. In terms of testing volume, right now in Maine, we are conducting roughly 421 tests for every 100,000 people. Again, for national context, nationwide, there are approximately 318 tests for every 100,000 people being conducted. And finally, a quick update on the testing numbers for individuals who list their residents as being out of state. Out of 12,490 total tests that have been done on individuals who list their another state as their primary residence, 298 of those tests have come back positive. Again, out of 12,500 or so total tests, 298 have come back positive among out-of-state individuals. The real number to compare that against is the total number of PCR tests that have been reported in Maine, and that number is 553,000. So out of 553,000 tests in Maine, approximately 300 have been positive among out-of-state individuals. That's where things stand from an epidemiological perspective. Governor Mills, I'll turn things over to you now. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for the update. Um, you know, uh, yesterday it was reported there were 517 additional deaths state, uh, countrywide, nationwide, from coronavirus, and 64,218 new cases nationwide. Thanks to the efforts of Maine people who have largely abided by public health measures to keep us all safe, our state, as you can tell from the data of it, uh, is reported by Dr. Shah. Our state has been largely successful in mitigating the spread of COVID-19 to date. We have gradually reopened businesses. We've welcomed visitors safely to our state through the summer and fall. Our case numbers and positivity rate have remained among the lowest in the nation and our economy's gradually rebounding. The quote, back to normal index, end quote, that value still ranks Maine as number one in the nation. And our unemployment as of today, our unemployment rate is down to 6.1%. The worst part of this pandemic sometimes can feel far away from uh, the relative safety, the relative safety of Maine. The statistics we hear nationwide seem far away, but and little by little, we let down our guard. And sometimes we want to reconnect with loved ones and friends, family that we haven't seen in months. We take a chance, we go to dinner at a friend's house with a small group of people you believe are taking the pandemic seriously. It feels almost normal after the constant worry of the last seven months and finally relax a little bit. You forget to wear your mask, you neglect to keep your distance and you think, well, it's okay because I live in Maine and the odds of catching the virus here are lower than in other states. Well, the odds of catching it here are low because people are taking precautions. But what you may not know is one of those people at the dinner party has COVID-19 and doesn't even know it. They don't have any symptoms. They're feeling okay. They have no warning. You have no warning. You go home, you see a few other friends, you stop by a neighbor's, you go to the grocery store, you go back to your place of work, never knowing that you have contracted the virus and that you're exposing others at that same time, including people you may never meet yourself, third hand, fourth hand. This isn't just a theoretical possibility, this is reality. It's what's happening in other states and it's what's happening here. One August wedding set in motion an outbreak that has infected almost 180 people and led to eight deaths across our state. A church service in Waldo County just described to you has contributed to more than 40 cases, been connected with those cases. It's not that anyone involved in these outbreaks is malicious, but the stark reality is anyone 
can cause an outbreak. A Millinocket town councilor told a, told a newspaper recently that the outbreak there, quote, opened my eyes and brought me back to reality. This can strike anywhere, anytime with anybody, he said. We still need to be aware <clears throat> and cautious and follow CDC guidelines, end quote. So as we enter the cold winter months and as more activities move indoors, we're confronting a new frontier in our fight against this virus. COVID-19 cases are climbing in nearby states, including Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Connecticut. And these spikes reportedly are driven by private gatherings in private homes and settings where people have let down their guard. We, we in Maine have significantly expanded testing to identify and isolate outbreaks before they spread. But testing alone cannot prevent new cases or a new outbreak. I've signed executive orders and strengthening the enforcement of health and safety measures in public, but those executive orders themselves will not prevent an outbreak that stems from that small dinner party at someone else's home or that Saturday night gathering at a social club down the road where you see your old friends or a celebration at your neighbor's barn for somebody's wedding or a special occasion, a birthday. Each of us must take responsibility for the trajectory of the virus in Maine. Every social interaction <clears throat> is a risk because the virus is everywhere. It's in every county, every community, and it affects every age group. We have to continue to fight it with everything we've got. People are getting tired, frustrated, impatient, anxious. It's been a long haul. It's gonna to continue to be a long haul. So bear with us, please. This virus can strike anybody, anywhere, anytime. We can't let down our guard. Pandemic fatigue, so-called, will have fatal consequences for all of us if we don't stay focused on the end game of keeping everyone safe. We're not gonna surrender to this virus. We're gonna use all the tools we have to protect ourselves, our loved ones, our neighbors, our first responders, our healthcare workers. Sometimes these tools are complicated like the national effort to develop a vaccine that will work and developing treatments that will slow the progress of the virus in individual cases. We're not there yet. The federal government's not there yet. But sometimes the most successful tools are the ones we've got in our back pockets, the simple ones, washing our hands frequently, using hand sanitizer, maintaining six feet distance between ourselves and others, no matter whether we're indoors or outdoors. Staying home when we can, especially if you're older or have an underlying health condition, which many, many people in Maine do, wearing a face covering wherever possible, whenever possible, indoors, outdoors, especially if it's going to be difficult to maintain six feet distance between ourselves and others. And get your flu shot. I got mine the other day, pretty, pretty harmless. Avoid and limit large gatherings, indoors or outdoors. If we protect ourselves and protect one another with these simple measures, we can limit the spread of this dangerous virus. We can ensure that our businesses will survive these colder months and we'll keep our schools open as we welcome winter in Maine. Maine people are independent and self-reliant. At the same time, we rely a lot on each other and we're sensible. Let's do the sensible thing. We've carved our character and our living out of Maine's forests, build hills and tablelands, its fields, shores, and mighty rivers. Living in Maine has not always been easy and it's not easy this year, but we have survived wars, depressions, booms and busts, previous diseases. We've suffered loss as a state and as families. Through it all, we've been lifted up by the courage, conviction, and resilience that comes from loving a place and its people as we love Maine and all of its people. That resilience defines our history. That resilience defines our future. And we will not give up our fight against this virus. We will not give up on each other. We will not surrender, but we'll do everything it takes to keep our communities and our people safe. And we will rise a stronger people and a stronger state. So stick with me, stick with us, keep the faith and stay safe. Thank you.
Thank you so very much, Governor. Uh, we'll turn over to our colleagues in the media, and I'm pleased to welcome back Don Kerrigan. Don, go ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Shah. I have I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, related to what you were saying about the situation with Brooks and surrounding areas, and particularly nursing homes, long-term care facilities. Uh, is you outlined us a few of the steps, such as mandatory testing, but is CDC and and DHS are you going to take even stronger measures with all of Maine's nursing homes uh, as we head into later fall and winter? Last March or so, it seemed a lot of steps were voluntary webinars, things like that. Is the state going to mandate more strict measures for nursing homes and long-term care? Commissioner Weber? Yeah, so we did implement emergency requirements in the spring that are effective now about infection prevention and control in nursing facilities in the state of Maine. We also are following federal guidance and requiring, not making it optional, that every nursing facility in Maine does both baseline testing of their staff and then periodic testing. And that periodic testing of all staff will increase with positivity rates or other factors when there is a potential outbreak or case in a nursing facility. We also continue to try to work in partnership with our nursing facilities on best practices for potential visitation, for engaging with uh, different volunteers or hospice workers. So when people are coming in and out of nursing facilities, we have a strict set of protocols that are there. And I do wanna thank our main nursing facilities. They have been partners. They want to keep their staff and their residents safe as well. So the short answer is yes, we have a series of requirements of nursing facilities, both from the state and from the federal government that we're implementing. We also are going over and above that to make sure that everybody in a nursing facility or a group home or an assisted living or other congregate living facilities are safe. A, a quick follow-up to that, and then I do have one other question about restaurants, if I might. The follow-up is, I recall again in April and May, one of the big concerns was staff members who travel from one home to another. Uh, has, I assume that continues. Are some of these steps uh, going to protect uh, from, from the disease being spread by those folks? Yeah, we certainly have addressed best practices in terms of staffing to prevent staff spreading uh, COVID-19 from facility to facility. We also this fall stood up a portal that will allow nursing facilities that may have a gap because a staff person out of an abundance of caution stays home. There's often been this concern about how do you fill in that gap. The state of Maine has been working with nursing facilities to provide a resource, a portal, where they can find temporary staff people to fill in those gaps. So we've worked hard with nursing facilities, both to train them to be safe, to give them best practices in terms of shared staffing, to prevent the spread of COVID-19, and to help them fill in those gaps when inevitably somebody needs to stay home to take care of themselves and the residents of those nursing facilities. And Dr. Shaw, if I may have just one more, it's about restaurants. As, uh, as you know, a, a number of restaurants are looking for ways to continue uh, outside service, uh, tents, igloos, things like that, uh, as cold weather comes in. But are those going to be any safer places for people to be since they're enclosed spaces? Are they going to be any safer than dining indoors? Don, that's an open scientific question. It's one that I've chatted with colleagues across the country about as well. We're thinking about that because on one hand, there is a benefit to being outdoors for things like the ultraviolet light. But if you've got a tent over you that's blocking a lot of that ultraviolet light and your tent has walls such that it's indoors, there is an open question about how much different it is on the, uh, than being indoors. On the other side, even a tent that's outdoors, even though it may have walls, will still probably have more ventilation and cross current than being indoors would. I don't think there's a firm answer right now, Don, to be completely straight with you. Uh, well, it, it depends a lot on the tent. It depends on how many people are in the tent, and it depends how long they're there for. Uh, we're, we are committed to working with restaurants across the state to explore options like this. Some of them, after we evaluate them, may in fact be safer than being indoors. Others may be equivalent to being indoors, and we'll have to make a judgment call 
about how we go about that working with the restaurant industry. I think right now where we are is in evaluating these ideas, understanding what the scientific data says, and then making sure we're working with restaurants so that we can share what the best practices are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, the fellowship gathering at the Brooks Pentecostal Church, I apologize if you already said this, but was that, do you know if that was indoors or outdoors? Uh, we, we understand that it was primarily indoors. Um, we, we know that there were some outdoor aspects of that being outside for certain periods of time. But uh, Patty, I, I, I think just for avoidance of doubt, it, it would uh, be best probably to reach out to the church itself. We understand that there was a mixture of indoor and outdoor activity, but I don't want to mischaracterize it. Um, again, our, what we've been told is that it was primarily an indoor activity. And then, you know, given sort of the some of the recent outbreaks that we're seeing, and then also I'm thinking about Don's question about nursing homes. At the beginning of the pandemic, nursing homes were a focal point of concern in terms of outbreaks. I'm just wondering at this point in the pandemic here, like where are your primary areas of concern for outbreaks? Sure, uh, Patty, nursing homes continue to be a concern. Uh, I, I don't wanna minimize the impact that an outbreak at a nursing home can have, even though as a, as a number, of, as the, as simply looked at by the number of outbreaks, they have they are not they don't figure as prominently as they did, but they are still occurring. For example, the one that I announced just at the top of the briefing at Duville in Lewiston. So they remain a concern for us. I don't think they've fallen down the rank the league tables there. I think what's happened is that other types of gatherings have risen in the league tables in our concern meter. Uh, right now, what we've seen occurring in other states. Uh, primarily in the upper Midwest and the Great Plains states, is that what's driving a lot of their case growth are small household level gatherings. Uh, not so much large nursing home, sort of major focal outbreaks, but smaller, uh, 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 more concerted outbreaks. That seems to be what's driving a lot of the growth. So even though we're, we still remain concerned about any area where folks can congregate, be that a nursing home, be that a crowded, um, uh, entertainment establishment, we're now starting to be more concerned with outbreaks that are occurring in smaller settings like homes, small gatherings like that. Okay, thanks. Going to turn next to Francisco Gonzalez at the Republican Journal. Hi, Dr. Shaw, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead, Francisco, loud and clear. I have two questions concerning the church and Brooks. Um, in your investigation so far, are you able to say uh, what specifically caused the outbreak? Well, Francisco, that's, you know, as we think about outbreak investigations, that sort of what triggered this, what prompted the outbreak to occur is always a question that we are thinking about. Right now, based on what we know right now, and I wanna stress how quickly things can change as we learn more information. But based on what we know right now, there appears to have been two events where people were brought together that seems to have gener that, that seem collectively to have generated cases. The first was the fellowship gathering earlier in the month. And then subsequent to that, a certain number of people continued to congregate in or around the Brooks Church itself that uh, allowed for further transmission to happen. So there were sort of two separate events, but uh, that, that allowed a, a small number of cases to grow into a larger number of cases. Uh, we're still learning more with each person we interview. We learn more and more about the nuances and dynamics. So as we learn more about those contours, we'll keep everyone updated. Uh, but what I've just shared, Francisco, is a very early hypothesis. I see. Can I have one more question? Um, I read recently uh, from the Facebook page of the Pentecostal Church that they had not had service since October 7th and they were in quarantine since the 10th. Um, and we in the media didn't hear of anything until uh, October uh, 20th, I believe, or 17th. I wasn't sure why there was a gap. Sure, so what there is a, you know, there's a difference between when individual church members themselves may, because they have detected that there might be folks who are not feeling well, they decided voluntarily based on what they've told us to stop church services. That's different from main CDC. Uh, it's different from those individuals 
going to the doctor because they're not feeling well, getting tested, having results reported to Maine CDC, and our investigators piecing this together. There can sometimes be a gap in those things. As soon as we pieced together what was happening from an epidemiological perspective, we made sure that day to make sure we had alerted folks, or th uh, shortly thereafter, to alert folks what may, uh, to what may have been going on. Uh, we understand that the church had voluntarily held off on having services, but that doesn't mean that there was necessarily an outbreak going on at that time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Evan Pop. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Um, I have a question first for Governor Mills and then um, for you, Dr. Shaw. So um, start off with you, Governor. Um, is there any chance you would call a special session of the legislature before the end of the year um, and why or why not? Uh, I haven't ruled it in or ruled it out. Uh, we're in the middle of a political season, an election season. Our first priority, obviously, is continuing to fight this pandemic. Um, I haven't had any recent conversations with leadership of either party about uh, any urgent matters that would require their attention between now and the end of the year. Uh, you know, the new legislature comes in and actually gets sworn in. Well, they start to convene in December rather than January, but I'm sure I'll be hearing from them in the next few weeks after the election. And is there any sort of um, like hard and fast deadline when you would make that decision by? I mean, obviously you'd have to make it before the, the next legislature is sworn in. Well, you know, what I, what I uh, told the leadership before they adjourned in March was that I would call, I committed to calling the back end when it was safe to do so. Um, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. So um, if there is urgent business to tend to that requires that to be prioritized, um, then we'll, we'll consider it. Um, I haven't ruled it in, haven't ruled it out. Thank you, Governor. Um, and then um, I guess this could either be a question for Dr. Shah or, or Commissioner Lambrew, um, whichever one of you wants to weigh in, but I'm wondering um, what the state's approach would be if more than one um, COVID vaccine ends up being approved, um, particularly if there is a vaccine that's shown to have a higher rate of, of effectiveness than another vaccine that's also approved. Uh, Evan, uh, thanks for raising that. I'll start, and Commissioner, if you'd like to weigh in on top of that, you know, uh, there are a number of vaccines that are working through their way through the phase three clinical trial process. And uh, our view is that we will take a look at the data as well as the analysis of the safety and efficacy of those vaccines that the US FDA's independent scientific committee, the, the evidence that they look at, as well as the independent scientific committee of the US CDC. We'll take a look at those It is, and, and then make decisions about how vaccine within Maine will be allocated. It's plausible that there will be multiple vaccines that are eventually approved. Uh, and and if, if and when that happens, Evan, and it's too early to speculate, if and when that happens, then we'll have to make decisions about what that means in terms of who might be receiving a vaccine on which timetable. The other possibility though, is that at a certain time period, there will only be one vaccine. And so we'll have to simultaneously think about scenarios under which there's only one vaccine in initially approved and how that affects to whom it might best be suited for. So there are so many twists and turns and scenarios about which vaccines might be approved at which times. We're planning around all of those. We're not paralyzed by the uncertainty in front of us. We are planning for scenarios under which they, these variations may happen. But at the same time, it's difficult to speculate and say with certainty. One of the foundations of our approach to COVID vaccines is flexibility. That's just kind of as evidenced by your question because there are so many different variations that could occur. And I'll add that we did do our first draft of our plan version 1.0 last week. We're going to be gathering feedback and input and opera opera operationalization ideas from main people, from main healthcare providers, from the front lines. But one thing that we will need, I think, from Washington, though, is support. To date, the state of Maine has only gotten $800,000 for implementation of a COVID-19 vaccine explicitly. We have heard recently from Washington that no more money is coming. So we are concerned that should we indeed be in the position of getting one or two or more vaccines, we yet to get have the support from the federal government to fully implement that aggressively. So. We are hoping that um, 
we can revisit that decision by Washington to really ensure the states have the support that they need to effectively, quickly, um, and humanely implement a COVID-19 vaccine once it becomes available. Thank you. I'm gonna turn now to Morgan at WABI. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, my first question is about, um, I just wanted to get an update from you on the hockey referee in Southern Maine. Were there any confirmed cases um, with the exposure there? Morgan, at this time, we're aware of one individual. We are still investigating whether that individual's exposure lines up with the time in which the referee was also on the ice to see if they were on the ice at the same time, and then also whether they had sufficient exposure. So that's where we are with that investigation. I'll have to check with our epidemiology team to see whether since this morning they've received additional reports. Uh, at the same time, Morgan, we are closely following developments with hockey more generally across even just the Northeast. Uh, other states that have made some more recent moves with respect to hockey, uh, as well as outbreaks that have been detected and documented in Alaska, Florida, some other states. So we're, we're, we're making sure we stay on top of those so we know what's going on. I have another question to ask you, but for this um, topic, can I ask you, does that surprise you that there is only one possible linked case to, to, to this? No, it, it, it's, you know, at the same time, first of all, in any type of mass exposure, uh, we don't necessarily know that there are those out there who may have been affected but didn't get tested, so on and so forth. So there are still some unknowns that still exist. And we've also seen at the same time, as I mentioned, significant outbreaks that have been documented in other hockey type situations, again, in Florida, Alaska, a number of others. So. Um, exposure is one element of needing an outbreak to occur. There are others. Um, and so a lot of those other variables are at play in as ultimately predicting or documenting whether an outbreak will occur. And um, I was wondering with the Waldo County outbreak, are any of the 42 cases, can you talk about if any of those cases are um, the people are being hospitalized within those cases. And when it comes to people in Waldo County, you know, moving forward in events like Halloween, where it is a rural community, are, are people safe to go out and participate in a safe manner when it comes to different festivities? Mm -hmm. uh, so Morgan, with respect to hospitalizations, we are aware that there are some, we'll get you the exact number, the most accurate number as of right now, we'll get that to you in just a bit. So you've got the most up-to-date information there. Uh, with respect to large gatherings, like things that might be coming up over Halloween, uh, it's still too early to speculate about what the conditions on the ground in Waldo County or indeed in that part of Maine may be 11 days from now. Uh, what I can say is that there is guidance that's been put forth by public health experts in Maine around how to have a safe Halloween. I think that guidance still stands, but as we get nearer to Halloween, if things on the ground change, if the complexion of the outbreak grows, things may have to change. Uh, that is part of being flexible during this time period. Right now, 11 days out, it's difficult to know in what direction things will go. What we will do on our end is make sure that we are equipping everybody with the facts so that they can apply the guidance in the ways that's best for their family. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thanks so much for taking my question. So we've now heard multiple reports, and by we, I mean the station here at Channel 8, of contact tracers calling people with inaccurate information regarding important details like exposure dates. So I was wondering if that's something that the main CDC was aware of, and also how long does the process take to contact all of the close contacts? And then what are the qualifications to actually become a contact tracer? So sorry, a few questions in there. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not, I can't comment on the reports that you've received. Uh, we have not received them. What I will say is that contact tracing, like all things in a pandemic or an epidemic, is highly dependent upon the facts. So the advice that a contact tracer gives to one person may be significantly different from the advice or recommendations they give to another person based on when the exposure happened, the duration of that exposure, the risk level, 
So there are a lot of nuances that go into providing advice for individuals whose symptoms are being monitored. The process really depends on where that person is in their overall exposure to the disease. After someone has been listed as a close contact, their name is given to the, the contact tracer who attempts to touch base with them. We have heard that some folks have said, well, I was a close contact and I never heard from Maine CDC. We've investigated those situations. And in many instances, we found that the individual case actually didn't list the person who was calling us as a close contact themselves. So in that situation, if someone doesn't give us their names of, of close contacts, we have no way of contacting them for contact tracing purposes. The qualifications to be a close uh, to be a contact tracer really do vary. We've got a wide array of individuals who have signed up to work with us as contact tracers. Some of them have backgrounds in healthcare and public health. Others have backgrounds in working with people on the phone, which is another skill set that's essential for being a contact tracer. So there's not one distinct skill set that one needs to have in order to be a contact tracer. You've got to feel comfortable calling people on the phone, comfortable with uh, handling sensitive topics, and at least have some fluency with what's happening with COVID. We put all of our contact tracers through a rigorous training program to make sure they understand all these twists and turns. But those people don't have to have like a medical background or a degree in that field? Well, the, the, um, contact tracing is a broad field. Uh, so. No, someone does not need to be a medical doctor or a nurse or uh, someone who's a healthcare professional in order to be a contact tracer. Uh, you've got to know kind of generally how COVID-19 works, which we train people on. And then you've got to be comfortable talking with folks on the phone. But you know, you do not need to be a medical doctor in order to be a contact tracer. Great, and sorry, just one more final question. Has there been any clarification about that positive COVID case, the positive individual who was on the ice at the same time as that hockey referee? I remember last time we were saying that was still being investigated. Yep. As I mentioned to Morgan and Allison, we are still investigating that to see whether the timelines link up before we definitively say that the case is related or is not related. We wanna make sure that the timelines sync up. Uh, the last thing I'll just mention really quickly, Allison, the standards that we use with respect to contact tracing, who can serve as a contact tracer, how they are trained, those are standards that are largely put forth by the US CDC and the Association of State Health Officers. We in fact use many of the training manuals that that organization as well as Johns Hopkins has put forth. So the way that we recruit and train contact tracers is very much in line with the way that other states are doing it as well. Great, thank you. Commissioner Lambert, any, anything on your end on that? Okay. Um, I'm gonna turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I have a quick technical question before my real questions. The, uh, on the zip code section of the main CDC website, Waldo County towns have not been updated since October 4th. Will that be happening soon in light of this outbreak? Um, I, I suspect that it will, Amy. I'll check with our informatics team to see where they are with respect to their next update. Okay, great. Is, and I, I'm not sure which of the three of you or maybe all this is for, but is the state considering changing the designation of Waldo County schools to perhaps yellow, given the outbreak or the cases in the school and the outbreak in Waldo County? What, what do you watch to determine that? What are the factors that go into making that decision? So we, Maine Department of Health and Human Services and Maine CDC, use a mix of qualitative and quantitative criteria to look hard at what go, what's going on in a county. That includes the nature of the outbreaks. Are there outbreaks in schools or other settings? It includes the positivity rate, the new case rate. We do strive to do this every two weeks when possible, given the fact that you really need to need to look at some trends to make sure that they're not fluctuations, especially in small counties. While the county is a relatively small county, so a rate may look especially high or low just because of the law of small numbers. All that said, we always, while we do strive to do this every two weeks, we plan to be updating the color counties, color advisories for counties this Friday. We always reserve the option to change it sooner should we see something disturbing. So we are closely watching what's going on in Waldo County. We plan on updating the colors for counties on Friday. 
but should we find something that in the qualitative or quantitative information um, suggests earlier action, we will do so. Is it looking the way things stand now, like on Friday, that is something that you would recommend? I think it's too early to speculate, but we are watching closely. Okay, thank you. And is there, and also I think for all three of you, whoever wants to jump in, is there nothing that can be done preemptively about churches that are gathering, having too many people inside singing, not wearing masks before they cause a community-wide outbreak? So I'll begin by saying, I think we, there are, there's evidence that when you have gatherings that exceed our limits, like we think occurred in this particular outbreak and the previous church outbreak, when there is a lack of protection or protocols being followed, face coverings, uh, distance, et cetera, that's where the risk is. It's not related to religious gatherings. In fact, not following those protocols in other settings, such as restaurants or um, other sorts of gatherings, pose equal threats. And I will say that we have had many religious gatherings around the state conducted safely. Celebrations, funerals, weddings have been conducted safely without spread of COVID-19 by following protocols. In fact, recently there was an op-ed written by a number of faith leaders in the state entitled, The COVID Crisis is About Public Health, Not Religious Liberty. And they wrote in this op-ed, as main faith leaders, we encourage people of faith and goodwill, especially during the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, to follow sound public health guidelines that help us live our healthiest lives while also protecting other community members, those known and unknown to us, but all known and beloved by God. So there is a way to gather safely for religious gatherings, but the same rules that apply in other settings also do apply to these gatherings. And we urge all the leaders of those organizations, as well as the congregants, to really look hard at the public health measures and to practice those so they can continue these types of gatherings. Well, the reason I'm asking specifically about churches is because with businesses in the past, uh, when asked about this, it was recommended that they be reported to the state. Code enforcement could be uh, and looking at their licensing could be a route for enforcement. We've now had two outbreaks at churches that have been pretty widespread in their communities. And we have churches that are openly discouraging their members from actually paying attention to the state safety guidelines. So again, they seem to have a special niche in terms of enforcement. Is that because this doesn't really fall into anybody's jurisdiction? So I can tell you what we have done, um, putting aside, I don't know whether or not there is that kind of promotion of unsafe practices, as you mentioned. What we have done is when we have gotten uh, credible information that there is a, a place of worship that may be out of compliance, we first of all work through our local officials, local health officers, district liaisons to reach out to try to provide the education that we often think does the trick. We also have sent notices as needed when we have made that communication and we continue to hear about unsafe practices or we haven't been able to make those connections. We have sent notices to these types of organizations. We have followed up with letters when we have also failed to have the kind of dialogue that we'd like to have to ensure that the practices that are happening are not due to lack of knowledge, but maybe just due to other factors. Um, and we'll continue to look at our options because um, we do have an obligation here in the state of Maine to protect all of our residents, including those who uh, go to places of worship. Thank you. Let me add that 99.9% .9 of uh, the communities of faith across the state of Maine have been extraordinarily cooperative and they don't wish their parishioners or their staff, their choir members to be exposed to this virus. Um, and again, the rules apply to them as any other place where people might gather. So when there have been uh, gatherings in any setting, our first job, our first priority is to make sure we get to reach out and get the cooperation of the people involved so we can contact those who may have been exposed and prevent further spread of the virus. That's the first and foremost effort uh, that the state of Maine uh, can make. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. I'm gonna turn next to Joel Lawler at the Press Herald. Um, yes, hi, thanks a lot. Um, a couple of questions about the um, 
the Waldo County outbreak. Um, is the school associated with the outbreak? Were they also um, in a similar boat in terms of uh, not following the guidelines, not having uh, kids and staff wear masks and, and social distance, et cetera? Uh, Joe, that's something that we are looking into as part of our investigation. Don't have an answer for you right now, but that is a question that we've raised and have asked. Okay, thanks. And my, my follow-up question is, has the, um, I know that the church leaders have um, said, you know, they've temporarily halted church services. Um, based upon what they've said so far, do you believe that once they do resume services that they'll be a lot better at, you know, having everybody wear masks and social distance and limit the size of the gatherings? Um, have they been fairly cooperative? Um, so Joe, let me, let me start by just briefly going back to the school piece that you raised. Uh, pursuant to Governor Mills's most recent executive orders, they would fall within the purview of the, the, the items that you mentioned, mask wearing within schools, things of that nature. So just to follow up to that. Um, in terms of what, they, what their um, adherence to these, these bedrock public health principles may be, uh, after they resume, I can't speculate, Joe. That that'd be a great question for them uh, to get their take on on where they think they will be going uh, when in-person worship services resume. Uh, we have been working with them. Uh, there, there's more to go in terms of information that we need, and we're hoping to get further information. But uh, what their what their landscape looks like as they resume services and how they will go about keeping their congregants and parishioners safe. Uh, that's something that we're, we're, we're standing ready and able to help them uh, walk through and guide them on, but ultimately they will have to be the ones that implement those. Uh, I'm gonna turn next to Jay Mishkin at WGME. Uh, good afternoon. Um, as you, I'm sure you know, both Connecticut and Massachusetts, the District of Columbia yesterday added both uh, Connecticut and Massachusetts, their list of states that, uh, you know, visitors have to quarantine from. Um, with Thanksgiving now uh, just around the corner, and while people certainly are discouraging travel from Dr. Fauci to yourself, uh, it's going to happen. I think we all acknowledge it's going to happen. Um, and people will be leaving the state and coming into the state, going to places like Massachusetts. Um, should people be expecting changes that could affect their Thanksgiving plans, whereas family going back and forth from Massachusetts say, um, whether, even if it's a small gathering, that they could see Massachusetts added back to that quarantine? Is that something that Mainers should be planning for? Let me, let me jump in to say, we're always discussing these, these data. Uh, we're always concerned about travel, wherever people go and come back from. I would encourage people who are traveling. There are a lot of reasons people travel to New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts. Massachusetts especially is home to so many colleges and universities to which Maine students attend. Uh, and it's, it's a place where um, medical facilities abound and specialists are there. People travel back and forth to Massachusetts for medical care, all kinds of reasons. Uh, I don't discourage that kind of travel, but I would encourage people to be extra cautious about going to states including Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, and New York. There, we've observed a, a, an upward trend in those states. It's uh, concerning. Uh, I'm not about to issue any other orders right now to mandate anything, but uh, I would caution people when they do travel to those other states uh, that they check themselves, that they get tested. Our standing order would cover a test for people who travel to and from other states like that. So we just encourage people to be extraordinarily careful. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I'm gonna turn now to Isha at the BDN. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Great, thanks. Uh, I have two questions today. The first one is about the uh, Brooks Church. So the pastor of that church works in security at Waldo County General Hospital. Is there a concern that he may have brought the virus to the hospital? It's something that we are we're aware of this Isha as well. Uh, as soon as we locate or found that up, uh, detected that information, we immediately got in touch with Waldo County General Hospital. So to work with them on contact tracing exposures within the hospital, uh, in the same way that we would after any individual healthcare worker at any hospital or clinic 
who has tested positive for COVID-19 in the same way that we would work with the hospital to start tracing contacts. We did the same thing with Waldo County General Hospital right now, or in this instance. Um, we're working with them to better characterize who may have been exposed. As we learn about those potential exposures, the hospital will then reach out to those patients or other employees to help coordinate immediate testing. Right now, I can't characterize the extent of those exposures. We're working with them to really develop who that might be. So just to follow up, right now, no employees or patients are quarantining because of potential exposure to this pastor? I, I will check to deter, I believe that to be the case, Isha, but rather than taking what I say right now, let me check on that with our epidemiology team and our medical officers to make sure that that is correct. We'll have an answer back to you very shortly. Great, thank you. So my second question is about public schools. Uh, as of last week, uh, Maine schools have seen 120 cases of COVID-19 in schools you know, generally have tested populations only once there has been an outbreak, like in case of Sanford High. So uh, my question is, why has Maine CDC not recommended testing at public schools um, or, you know, recommended that public schools put into place testing much like Maine's universities and colleges have? So there are some significant differences between colleges, universities, and schools. Uh, namely, the controls that have been placed within schools to keep students who attend them, as well as the teachers in tight pods, as well as significant investments in things like engineering controls to reduce the likelihood of transmission. Indeed, according to some data that a noted Brown University economist has put forth, there's actually been at a nationwide level, not very much transmission within schools. There have certainly been cases of COVID-19 that have been detected in schools, but that, according to Professor Oster, seems to be more a reflection of the baseline community rates of COVID-19 rather than transmission in the schools. I'm referencing here the work by the economist, um, Professor Emily Oster at Brown University. So uh, given on top of that, the, uh, the, the, the notion that children themselves appear to transmit COVID-19 to themselves less than adults would. All of these factors suggest that the engineering controls, the lower level of transmission, set schools in a different category than say colleges and universities, where there's interaction both within the, the classroom and outside of the classroom, leading to several opportunities for transmission, as well as outbreaks that, that can occur because of the close nature of the congregation. I think all of those factors differentiate schools, elementary and middle schools from colleges and universities. Okay, I was just wondering because the US CDC just recently released guidelines for public testing at schools, which wasn't there, you know, less than a week ago, they released that. So I was wondering if there's any, if there's been any change in policy about public school testing. Those guidelines have, have been uh, with the US CDC and, and available. Uh, and, and one note is that they don't recommend baseline testing. It, it, they only really recommend it in situations of extremely high community transmission. Uh, the metrics that they set forth are metrics that are not where Maine is right now at all. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last question for the afternoon goes to Patrick Whittle. Thank you very much. Um, yesterday, uh, Vice President Mike Pence was here for a, uh, for a rally slash gathering in the Bangor area. Um, there was a, it was a pretty large crowd. Uh, organizers estimated it at more than a thousand. Um, I'm I'm curious uh, how the uh, the state's limitation on outdoor gatherings comes in comes into play. Is is an event like this exempt from those rules, and is uh, is is the state uh, considering this in any way? Well, let me jump in first of all. There have been. A number of different gatherings for a number of different purposes, political, non-political, and it's disappointing that those gatherings are occurring, whether it's a march in Portland, a, a rally in Bangor, Brewer, and Herman, or uh, somewhere else in the state of Maine. We keep saying, please limit gatherings. Don't attend large gatherings. Maybe the people didn't know it was going to be that large a gathering. I don't know how large the gathering was yesterday. I only know from press reports. Maybe there were a couple hundred, maybe possibly a thousand, but regardless, uh, I guess, you know, my advice would be for the people attending that, that gathering 
to be cautious, isolate themselves, uh, and uh, get tested because they probably have been exposed to any number of people who may be uh, carrying the virus, which is too bad. I'm disappointed personally. I'm saddened because Vice President Pence is the chair, uh, the head of the um, President's uh, Coronavirus Task Force. We're on the phone together every week. And just a few weeks ago, I did ask him directly, what is the administration's policy? What is the administration's position on gatherings and uh, wearing face masks and avoiding us and, and keeping distance from people? And he paused and he said, it is our strong recommendation that people avoid large gatherings keep distance, keep six foot, foot distance from people, other people and wear face masks. Um, I was disappointed from what I heard that he did not heed his own advice yesterday. Thanks, Patrick. And uh, Governor, that was the last question for the afternoon. So I'll turn things back over to you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you, Commissioner Lambrew, uh, members of the press. Um, I just want to say to the people of Maine, look, it's going to be a nice weekend this weekend. It's only Tuesday right now, but there's still foliage out there to be seen. You know, <clears throat> get outdoors, uh, enjoy the outdoors. We had a 68% increase in campground reservations in September over, over a year before. So people are getting outdoors and they're doing things that they should be doing, keeping their distance, staying safe for the benefit of all the outdoors that Maine has to offer. And I would also ask people, invite people to order their food from local restaurants and and uh, uh, groceries, order them curbside, pick up curbside, have it delivered, order services and goods from local stores, support your small businesses, especially main small businesses. That's what I would urge people to do. And I think it's time for me to have a mid-afternoon snack. <laughs> Thank you. Well, with that, I think that was a good time to adjourn for the afternoon. <laughs> so thank you all uh, for joining us. As always, please be kind take care of one another and eat healthy. So have a good afternoon, everyone.